Dave here. This week's podcast is entitled 1000 Plus Years of UK Monarchies. And we're looking at whether or not there have been any changes over that period. As an introduction, let's have a look at the time zones. The Normans from 1066 to 1154. The Norman invasion led by William the Conqueror reshaped Britain from the rise of the castles to the French words that began to appear in the English language. The Middle Ages, 1154 to 1485. The Plantagenet era was a time of conflict burnished by stories of Richard the Lionheart and victory at Agincourt in 1415 during the Hundred Years' War. The Tudors, 1485 to 1603. The Tudor era covers the Renaissance and Henry VIII to the Golden Age and Elizabeth I via Shakespeare and the Spanish Armada. The Stuarts, 1603 to 1614. The Stuart period witnessed the Great Plague, the Fire of London, religious and political upheaval, the English Civil Wars, a Republic and the restoration of the Crown. The Hanoverians, 1714 to 1901. The British Empire reached its peak under foreign rule with four King Georges, William IV and Queen Victoria. The modern era, 1901 to the present day. Today's monarchy, with Queen Elizabeth II at the helm, has officially adapted and reinvented itself through two world wars and social revolution, i.e. most of the publications by royal historians, including the comedy store group of sycophants, write things in order to keep employment and to ensure that the indoctrination continues, as it has done through centuries. On a personal perspective, I do not see any evidence of the UK royal family reinventing itself. It has been more of ensuring that the general public see, hear and read the message that the royal family and the government officials wish to give, and with the unwritten contract with the media in place since the 1970s, the repetitive nature of that official message has managed to convince some opinions about the state of the nation, etc. The onset and growth of social media has given a wider range of platforms for this propaganda to reach more people in the UK. But what the monarchy failed to remember, those wider platforms include a global audience and over time, Particularly in recent years, the narrative emanating from the UK is no longer seen as the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The UK media efforts to double down on their effort to persuade public opinion in and external to the UK is faltering. And with each increased effort to distract people with one set of information, it has led to increasing numbers of people who had zero interest in royal affairs, but who noticed a concerted drive to tarnish certain members of the royal family over the years. Whilst others, who could legitimately attract a similar ire, had nothing said about them, or very little. It became very obvious that the heirs to the throne in the UK never attracted criticism. It is an unwritten rule. If you study history of the royals in the UK, you will notice the trend to always have a scapegoat as a foil for taking the blame and the punishments for the person above them, who is high in the line of succession. 
Centuries ago, the punishments were extremely harsh, and some led to death by the method of punishment chosen. The scapegoat initially was the member of the household, who by agreeing to be a scapegoat for a royal, led a life of cosmetic luxury, i.e. received good education, dressed well, became the best friend of the heir, but who also took the beatings and the whipping and any other punishment for their master. The role eventually got handed on to the next sibling to follow the heir, and the term whipping boy was born. I have previously published a podcast on the whipping boy scenario and how the name came about and the types of punishment that was used to exist, that used to exist, and the use of an actual goat initially, who was sent off into the wilderness carrying baggage on its head and back to represent the misdeeds of the air. The goat was left to die a natural death through the neglect. There are stories in history books about the children of slaves thrown into a crocodile infested waters in parts of the world as a method of burying the sins of others. Modern day whipping boys in the UK are those they refer to as the spares. The children deliberately brought into the world purely to be the footstool of the heir. And if anything happened to the heir, whether by death or deed, the spare would be available to step into the shoes and run with a huge role of being the next monarch. One only has to look at the mental health issues that have befallen most spares, and certainly those in the modern era. Quoted in the introduction. Can hardly be described as adapting or reinventing itself other than finding ways to describe their purpose to the nation as being useful and important, whilst basically carrying on as they have always done for centuries. People given important roles which affect a wider population than just their family, with no assessment of skill or competency or judgment, but awarded it by order of birth. Equally subsequent children in those families were treated as footstools and foot soldiers for everyone higher up in the ranks. Of all the supposed troublesome individuals in the history of UK royalty, the person who is deemed to have put the UK monarchy in crisis is the only one who chose to walk away from a toxic environment i.e. Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, for the security of his and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, mental health and that of their family, and to commit the worst sin, apparently, a wish to be financially independent of the UK taxpayer. All the other perceived problematic individuals are still within the fold and embrace the UK monarchy living at taxpayers' expense, including accommodation, security in some cases, and education for their children, and many with questionable activities regarding securing funds from questionable individuals. And creative accounting to help smooth things over, whilst the couple who wish to leave and work for a living to be financially independent of the monarchy have been treated like pariahs and traitors, and those responsible need to be held to account for their practices. I am confident that no matter how long it takes, justice will be served. So, when you read about the so-called heritage, and how the royal family are there by divine right, and that they are all upstanding individuals worthy of your coins. Remember that whilst too many of the vulnerable in this country have to choose between heat or food, and in some cases go without both some days of the year, take a moment to stand back and really examine what a monarchy is and what it stands for, 
and how it benefits any modern society today. Then look back at all those who were chastised within various UK monarchies of the past and do your research and evaluate whether they actually committed acts so bad that warranted their subsequent treatment. When you read about the monarchies which have disappeared in the modern era around the world, some have been quite violent, along with some kind of political upheaval. The desire to hang on to a way of life of unearned privilege is strong. Be mindful of that when you read and hear about the UK monarchy, as all of it is stated by people who have a vested interest in the current state of affairs continuing, not least because their income and lifestyle depends upon it. There is a saying that the only people who are against you having boundaries are those who benefit from you having none. Now, let's have a look through a selection of scandals in UK monarchy. But only the Sussexes accused of threatening the future of the monarchy. Let's start with King Edward VIII, who rejected the crown in 1936 in order to marry a divorced American woman. Edward took the throne upon the death of his father in 1936. He renounced the throne less than a year later. The reason for giving up the monarchy was due to him falling in love with an American socialite named Wallace Simpson. Wallace was already divorced and with the development of a serious relationship with Edward, she was on her way to sorting out a second divorce. Edward's affair with a married woman was deemed a scandal at the time, and with the added pressure that Wallace had already been divorced once before. The Church of England would not allow for Edward to marry anyone who had been divorced, which resulted in Edward having to abdicate. Edward gave a statement in a radio address to the nation in 1936 which included the following words. I have found it impossible to carry out the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king without the help and support of the woman I love. End of quote. Edward and Wallace married in 1937 and remained together until Edward's death in 1972. Edward and Wallace are buried in the Royal Burial Ground at Frogmore House, not the cottage, the actual main house. Despite the fact that they share the grounds with several other members of the royal family, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert to name two, their graves were purposely placed at a distance from the other members of the royal family. Note that this is near to Frogmore Cottage, the home that was allocated to Harry and Meghan. So not only are there obvious links with the first Duke of Sussex and how he fared with the royal family back in history, and Harry and Meghan given the second Duke of Sussex title, and their UK home is on the grounds where a King of England wanted to marry an American divorcee and he had to step away from the throne to do it. And this is where that couple are buried. Even in death, the graves are deliberately placed a distance away from the rest of the royal family buried there. The petty and vindictive streak runs deep in that family and goes back centuries. Reap what you sow comes to mind in terms of a UK monarchy. The next so-called scandal, Princess Margaret, who in 
who fell in love with a married man. Captain Peter Townsend was a Royal Air Force officer who served as an equerry with the Royal Family. He was known to spend a lot of time with Margaret and quickly fell in love with each other. But there was a problem. He was already married. In 1953, Peter Townsend divorced his wife and proposed to Margaret. As we know from the previous example, the Church of England refused such a marriage to take place, made worse by the fact that there was already scandal of Edward, Margaret and, and Elizabeth's uncle, having to relinquish the throne in order to marry a divorcee. The relationship ended in 1955, when the engagement was called off. There was no happy ending for this couple. Very quickly, after the relationship between Margaret and Peter Townsend ended, Margaret married Anthony Armstrong Jones. This was the first royal wedding to be televised. It wasn't long before the marriage itself became a topic of the media, particularly the New York Times, where it described the union as a source of growing public ridicule. Much of the reason for this was the very public arguing between the couple and increasing vacations of Margaret without her husband. And then the rumours began about a close relationship with a man 17 years her junior. In 1976, the couple announced their separation and two years later they were divorced. Margaret became the first royal to divorce since Henry who reigned in the 1500s. Henry VIII, that is. Princess Diana and an alleged lover were secretly recorded on the phone. In 1992, whilst Prince Charles and Princess Diana were still married, media outlets published the transcript of a conversation between Diana and an alleged lover, James Gilby. In the conversation, James told Diana that he loved her and called her by the pet name of Squidgy, apparently 53 times. The scandal was named after this pet name and was referred to thereafter as Squidgy Gate. In a subsequent interview, Diana confirmed that the conversation took place but denied that it was adulterous in nature. The same thing happened to Princess Diana's husband, Prince Charles. Soon after the transcript of the conversation between Diana and James Gilby was published, another appeared in the press. This time it was one between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles, a long-time married friend. The transcript confirmed the rumours that had been circulating for quite some time that Charles and Camilla were romantically involved. A quote from the Insider, it is the name of the publication, and there is a link to it in the reference sources at the end of the article, used for this article is as follows. In one of the more confounding parts of the conversation, the couple jokes about Charles turning into a tampon in order to live inside Camilla's trousers, end of quote. Later, the same year, Charles and Diana announced their separation. The Diana interview. In 1995, Diana gave that now even more famous interview to a BBC journalist, Martin Bashir, where she talked about the immense pressures of public life and her struggles with self-harm, postpartum depression and bulimia. It was this interview where Diana revealed that she knew about Charles' affair with Camilla and a quote, a famous quote from Diana, there were three of us in this marriage, 
so it was a bit crowded. Diana admitted in that interview that she had been unfaithful to Charles with James Hewitt, her riding instructor. James said, Diana said, that she had been in love with James Hewitt. A direct quote from The Insider. More recently, the BBC interview itself has since become under scrutiny. An article in the Sunday Times in 2020 alleged that the Bashir manipulated Diana into doing the interview by showing her brother Charles Spencer fake bank statements that purported to show media had been paying for royal associates for information about her. A 2021 inquiry concluded that Bashir acted in a deceitful way and the BBC and Bashir apologised. A few weeks after the Bashir interview, the Queen urged Charles and Diana to divorce. The following year, they made it official. Charles and Camilla subsequently got married in 2005. Princess Anne divorces her husband and marries a member of the royal household. Princess Anne, the only daughter of Queen Elizabeth II, married Olympic equestrian Mark Phillips in 1973. The couple spent large amounts of time apart and did not appear to be happy, according to the tabloids. One magazine described the marriage as a joyless sham. In 1989, a UK tabloid, yet again, obtained stolen copies of letters written by Anne to one of her equerries, a British naval officer named Timothy Lawrence. The contents of the letters were never made public. Tabloids described them as extremely intimate and too hot to handle. In 1992, Princess Anne announced that she would be divorcing Mark Phillips and that she planned to marry Timothy Lawrence. They are still together. Sarah Ferguson caught in a compromising position with a male friend. Sarah Ferguson, for those of you who don't know, is the former wife of Prince Andrew, the Duke of York. I haven't elaborated in the article and I won't be on this podcast because of the nature of the activities um, between Sarah and this friend. But there is a link in the reference sources should you wish to explore. The information, it involves toe-licking incident by the said friend on Sarah. And we'll leave it at that. And among many things that seem to emanate from Sarah or Andrew, one of Sarah's um, scandals, another one, was she was accused of taking a bribe. And the bribe, the amount of money was $633,000. Again, you will be able to find that in the reference links that I've given at the end of the article. There is a pattern of activities, dubious activities, involving sums of money over the years with this couple and others, I have to say, including senior people in the line of succession. Um, But there was no need to go through every one of those because we'd have been here all day, trust me but there are references if you wish to look them up. Prince Harry spends a day in rehab, but all was not as it seemed. When this article appeared in the tabloid media, it was many, many weeks after it came to light that Harry had indulged in taking a drug. Following a conversation with Prince Charles, and his advisers, it was decided to put this into the public domain in a controlled way and make it seem like 
it had just happened. This was done to make it look like Charles was being a good father and that he was aware of the pain that his sons may be going through, etc., with the loss of their mother. This rehabilitation clinic was booked for a day and photos taken of the outside of the establishment and the story ran for weeks. In later years, one of the royal reporters went on record to say it was all contrived for the benefit of Prince Charles. There was no real concern for Harry, only how it would look to the public. So, in the article, and hopefully there will be a slide appearing on your screen soon, here is a photo of the outside of the establishment where Harry stayed for one day. It was obvious the photograph was there to tick a box, so to speak, and that it was as far as Charles and the family were concerned, the end of it. There is the famous photo of Harry dressed in a Nazi uniform, which the haters like to bring up <clears throat> and use against Harry, but they and the tabloid never state that William was at the same event, but there is no mention of this in any article. Harry has learned from his mistakes and is a better person for it. In all of the so-called scandals of the royal family in this modern era period, none of them were treated in a sustained manner like they have treated Prince Harry and continue to do so this, to this day. Only Harry has been accused of destroying the monarchy for whatever reason, is flavour of the month on any given day. The treatment of the spares over the years is plain to see in terms of their unhappiness and in terms of the willingness to destroy anyone who dares to think independently of the royal family machine. Then anything is acceptable treatment, no matter the outcome. I haven't included the Nazi photo here because I, continue, I consider its continual use by the press and the royalists to be abusive and is done to tarnish his name as they have nothing of merit to use of him in his adult life. Rather, nothing that they feel comfortable to use. There are plenty of um, photographs, images, stories of the wonderful things that Harry has done and is doing, but that doesn't suit their argument, so you don't hear about those. People have tried, and they only look foolish in doing so, trying hard to find negative spins on any story that will attract clickbait. The Nazi image is famous because of this approach, and therefore I refuse to use it. Knowing that William attended this same event like so many others that only Harry is photographed and splashed across tabloids, just makes me and many others work hard for the day when we can have a vote on the existence of a monarchy at all. No matter how many years it takes to have this option on a ballot paper, it will happen. And no matter how long it takes to secure enough votes to make it happen, Again, it will happen. It is time. Megan walking down the aisle on her own. All the efforts that went into preventing this marriage from taking place failed. Years later, we are learning more and more how much the tabloids were involved with Megan, with Megan's father side of the family, and were paid accordingly and still are. When the drama around Meghan's father developed and all the fake stories about heart conditions, etc. and who would walk her down the aisle when the said father refused to attend, citing illness, Prince Charles was seen to step into the frame and save the day. Once again, it was self-serving. I am forever grateful that Meghan still insisted in walking most of the aisle by herself. 
as a representation of the strength of women, not needing to have a man on your arm in such circumstances. So, just like the Harry rehab incident, Charles was seen to the world as this caring man and stepping into the breach. Increasing numbers of people are now seeing that for what it was. My favourite image of the day was Megan walking the aisle alone as she entered the chapel. The light through the windows just hit right and the image is simply stunning and extremely powerful. Prince Andrew resigned from his post due to questionable friendships. Believe me, I could have had so many headings related to Prince Andrew, but this is just one. I really do not need to elaborate here on the antics and practices of Prince Andrew. There are a couple of images there, but I'm not going to say anything about them. They're famous in their own right. It is well documented and have given sources of information for those who wish to read more about the number of things done, which do more than tarnish the royal family. But you won't read that interpretation in the UK tabloid press. If anything has removed the more than one cornerstone of the existence of UK monarchy as a structure, it is the activity of Prince Andrew on so many fronts. And one day it will come to light, but not for many decades yet. Harry and Meghan have been used as distraction for the weaknesses of the next two heirs, particularly the second in line, and definitely to cover any misdeeds done by Prince Andrew or anyone else for that matter in the family. The rest are all window dressing with fake outrage. It is not that the misdeeds have not taken place, it is that the media and the royal family and royalists do not care about any of them. They care about the increasing dissatisfaction of the UK public about the existence of a UK monarchy and turn a blind eye to most of the things that should actually attract attention. Instead, we have had five years and continuing foul reporting on anything that the Sussexes do. At the root of this treatment is racism because they do not consider Meghan as a person who has feelings and because of her ethnicity, none of the royalists care about the impact of their treatment of her. And if in abusing her, they can distract from other misdeed going on in the royal family, then it's considered acceptable collateral. If the treatment causes Meghan to leave the UK, then it's a double win in their eyes. As we know now, all of the Sussex family moved out of the UK. The scapegoats escaped. What did the UK media do? Upon the instruction, approval of the royal family is to go after the Sussexes, cause them hardships to make them return to the classy abuse behind gilded gates. That plan never worked. And now the abuse continues across borders to a family who are not funded by UK taxpayers in this great effort to distract from what is really going on in the UK. The reality is we have two very weak and unpopular heirs lined up and neither of them hold enough support to feel comfortable. Prince Charles does have many projects to his name that are successful and were started by him in his younger days. He is not, however, likely to introduce much change and he will never be forgiven for the treatment of his first wife. Never. So the outcome of that will show itself once he is made king. As for Prince William, he has no projects that he has started and worked on and completed in any meaningful way. In fact, work has been questionable. 
That is definitely the weakest link in the lineup, and his dictatorial style is a recipe for disaster for the country. But hey, let the UK media, with the UK monarchy's approval, take the heat as being the biggest scandal in the royal family. One person leaving an organisation does not cause an organisation to fold unless the others in that organisation were lacking in competence and business skills. The person who left with his family is already set for life, whilst proving that service is universal. So let the royal family in the UK continue to destroy themselves by these acts taken from a playbook that is no match for today's society. The UK monarchy and its media chased away their largest asset due to fragile egos and now they are running scared but looking like a child who is pretending that they have done nothing wrong. Nothing to see here, etc. There should be, hopefully, a slide on your screen and there is definitely an image in the article which are logos of various businesses who failed to read the room and who either disappeared from the landscape or teetering very close to going out of business altogether. There is a lesson just by looking at that image with very famous, once high profile companies who are doing what our current royal family is doing, failing to read the room, or in this case, failed to read the room. Monarchies are gradually disappearing. Here are some quotes from the publication The Week, published on the 3rd of February 2020. When Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, announced their decision to step away as senior royals and strike out on their own, the British royal family joined the ranks of other royal families facing a changing reality. Months before Harry and Meghan reached their compromise with Queen Elizabeth II, the Swedish royal family had stripped certain family members of royal titles and cut them from the royal payroll. Meanwhile, in Spain, members of the royal family have been removed from the succession after receiving prison sentences for corruption and tax fraud. And in Japan, the future of the royal family is in peril because of outdated succession and laws that discriminate against its female members. 44 of the world's 195 countries are monarchies. As a result of how the British Empire dissolved itself, 16 of these 44 have Queen Elizabeth II as their head of state. With the exceptions of Saudi Arabia, Brunei, Oman, Esfatini and the Vatican, all monarchies are constitutional monarchies, which means that the sovereign is a figurehead with limited political influence and power. During the 20th century, a newly created country could become either a republic or a monarchy. Israel, Lebanon and Poland are examples of the former. Norway, Iraq, Saudi Arabia and Spain are examples of the latter. At the same time, old monarchies became republics, often by force, with Cambodia bucking the trend and reinstating its monarchy in 1993. Two decades into the 21st century, the idea of a country declaring itself to be a monarchy seems almost alien. Has the monarchy, as a system of government, become obsolete? Monarchies, as a system of government, began to fall out of favour in Europe during the 18th century, when the movement known as the Enlightenment 
put the age-old connection between religion, politics and social hierarchy under scrutiny. Out of these debates grew the oldest and still existing political ideology of liberalism. Liberation developed as a response to the absolutist, the absolutist monarchies that had dominated the European continent for the past few centuries. Absolution describes a system of government based on a monarchy dominated and controlled by the sovereign. It developed from the 16th century onwards. It too, in response to what came before, namely the monarchy of the Middle Ages, where the sovereign's power were, was counterbalanced by a council of nobles. King Louis XIV of France, 1638 to 1715, perhaps described absolution best when he quipped, La tête c'est moi, or I am the state. According to liberalism, all citizens are equal, with the right to self-government and self-expression, in a time dominated by absolute, absolutist monarchies ruling over vast cross-continental empires and supported by either the Catholic Church or a Protestant state church, these claims proved to be explosive. The first liberal revolution was the American Revolution in 1776, soon followed by the French in 1789. Having rid themselves of George III and Louis XIV respectively, the Americans and the French reconstituted themselves as republics, drawing inspiration from their forebears of antiquity, the Greek city-states and Rome, and establishing a government for the people, by the people, without any religious influences. This is what we today call liberal democracy. Together with the equally disruptive ideology of nationalism, liberalism piggybacked on the reach of the European empires across the globe and ignited independent movements and revolutions in places such as Haiti against the island's slave owners, the Philippines, and Latin America against the Spanish, Africa and Asia against the French and the British. At the dawn of the 20th century, socialism joined the group of disruptive ideologies. The result was the toppling of even more monarchies, this time in Russia, China and Ethiopia, just to name a few. The chaos created by World War I brought down the Germans, Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires, all of them almost exclusively replaced by either liberal or social democrat republics. Harry and Meghan are thriving, not just surviving. They can read a room. The biggest scandal to hit the royal family is their lack of workforce planning, their inability to read the environment and their reliance on the public seeing them as anointed and entitled people to be in a UK monarchy. The Sussexes have left the island and all of their supporters have gone with them. The royalists left behind are no match for Sussex Squad. We are a global support network and one which is business savvy and dedicated to providing universal service in our communities along with supporting any Sussex endeavours. More than anything, we are lifetime supporters of Harry and Meghan and their family. Royalists continue to show their true colours and in doing so, are helping the family to bring UK monarchy to an end. 
leaving a toxic environment where a whole country establishment are intent on trying to destroy your character and mental health every day is not a crime. No one can be called and treated like a traitor because you chose safety of your family and improvement in your mental health. It is not duty to be born into a regime where you have limited choices and where you are told you can never leave. That is modern slavery in an opulent setting. The scandal is that UK taxpayers are funding a plantation behind gilded gates and have no problem with the regime inside. A regime where children are brought into the world whose main function is to ensure the monarchy structure continues to exist. People given positions which impact on the general public without any skill, but purely based on the order of birth and the birth canal you come from. That is the scandal. And after 1,000 years, it is time for sensible people to look at this for what it is. Enjoy the history, but accept that, that times have changed and there is no credible reason that exists to continue these slave-like practices and even worse, demand those people who are living in some cases in abject poverty, in too many cases, to pay for a figurehead family that has gone past its use-by date. That is the biggest scandal and it needs rectifying. That's the end of this week's podcast. The article will be out tomorrow afternoon, as usual. I look forward to the comments and I'll speak to you again next weekend. So it's a bye from me. Bye from Ivy. Bye.